The starting point obviously is poverty. Poverty is in two forms. Um, classically, I was brought up with Townsend, which is a relative poverty, and you have absolute poverty. Landscape is fundamental to both. If you have absolute poverty, landscape is there. Uh, you should be designing it to ensure you have clean water, you have food, that you have um, uh, somewhere, to, somewhere to shelter, somewhere to be protected, somewhere to feel safe. These are landscape fundamental issues. All of the fundamental human needs in relation to poverty are landscape issues. We have been tackling perhaps more in this country, fortunately we have very little absolute poverty, although I think we could probably all tap a little bit of it if you look a little bit more closely. Uh, we're going to be talking about relative poverty, and I'm going to take you on a little journey of relative poverty, which is in effect around one simple scheme that we've been working on in Barrow in Furness, which we're very fortunate to win. But before we get there, investment in public spaces. When it comes to poverty, when landscape architects or anyone does any work on public open spaces, you will be reducing crime, you will improve health, you will contribute to educational standards. It will be sociable, it will be safe, it will be for your children, it will be accessible, it will be good for the elderly. It could be beautiful, it may be maintained, it will provide jobs, it will contribute to the micro, meso, macro environment, it will be plant rich, it will be biodiverse, it will be flexible. I actually thought for two of the speakers that I haven't even put, you might even be able to grow things in there as well. You can add. You come under the etc, 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 only I can only apologise for that. Landscape does all of these things. Of course it can address poverty. It is a key component of addressing poverty. Our job here is to make everyone else realise that that is true and start investing in landscape. So back to my scheme, Barrow in Furness. Um, interestingly, just been talking about Glasgow. Glasgow has knocked down nearly all of its traditional tenement blocks. If you want to go and look at what an old tenement block looked like in Glasgow, you go to Barrow in Furness. And this little number here is the remnants of one of the tenement blocks built by the same architects that built them in Glasgow. And what's very interesting about those is that these are now a conservation area and are protected <laughs> to start listing on them because actually they're quite a rarity, which is probably a good thing. But of course, they actually, in some ways, were quite remarkable buildings. <laughs> here they are. Barrow in Furness. Everyone here was sitting in the southeast. There are 620 of these flats. They're all identical. They're all working blocks like that. Open stairwells. It's, it's pretty bleak. All built over 100 years ago now. Um, you can buy one of these on a credit card. If you want a two-bed, two-bathroom house in one of these flats, you can pick one up for about seven and a half grand. Uh, 482 of them are empty. We have a housing crisis in South Lakes, as you do down in London. 482 of these well-mannered, perfectly reasonable blocks, frankly, in a conservation area, remain completely unoccupied. This is a community like no other. Barrow is at the end of the road. Um, it's a town that, other than supplying uh, Trident nuclear missiles and submarines, um, uh, uh, does very little else. The community that we found in terms of levels of deprivation here are, um, and the challenges that we faced are follows. It's a desolate and harsh landscape, it really is. If I just go back one, there aren't many plants even living here. You know, even the weeds are struggling in this place. It has very low maintenance standards. The council does not come here at all. Their brief to us when we actually got this job was, as long as you don't increase the costs of maintenance. I said, how much do you spend on maintenance? Not a lot, actually. <laughs> it's true. I said, um, so am I allowed to plant any trees? I said, well, no, and, 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 and I've said this in a lecture, and I've been promised that I'm not supposed to say this, but it's actually sort of a truth, is um, because professionally, you're not, it's not really in the code of conduct that you should lie. But every now and again, lying is kind of <laughs> quite useful. Um, the county council came down and said from the highways, because it's all highways land, and they said, uh, uh, they said um, no, um, we don't want you to plant any more trees. Do you realise Do you realize we maintain 2,019 trees in Barra? <laughs> and, I'm, and I'm sitting there and I said, um, oh, is that, sorry, is that a lot or a little? <laughs> and they said, that's a huge number. I said, well, I've only done a little bit of work on it. I haven't done much work on this, but we're doing a little scheme in Lewisham at the moment. And in Lewisham, which is about the same size geographically as Barrow, they maintain 125,000 trees. 
So off he went with his tail between legs. I have absolutely no idea how many trees <laughs> are maintained illusion. But he got the job done. It allowed me to have my trees in my master plan. <laughs> we have here empty flats. You have an investment environment. If you're in London and you look at this, you think, this is bloody brilliant. Look, you've got eight flats coming off a staircase. You put the new lift shaft here. Brilliant. About 60 grand to put a lift in. That's it. That seals at those corners. It's all going to be great. Fantastic. If you've got a flat that's worth 7500 no one's investing to even put a kitchen in. You can't even afford to put a new kitchen. The kitchen's worth the same price as the whole bloody apartment. It doesn't work. You've got no investment environment here whatsoever. You have utter deprivation. 27% of the people, 27 of the people that live here cannot read or write. We have an education system, believe it or not, says that that's not true since post-war. We had to do the consultation where I had a guy come up to me saying, look, I know my brother's going to be coming. He's just a bit embarrassed. He doesn't want to come to the consultation. But um, would it be all right if he just stood outside? If he just stand outside and just hold a pen next to the clipboard, if he feels that you're going to write it down for him and therefore he could just, he'll have the confidence to come and he'll bring his sister and his mum and dad might come as well. But if you, if you do it so that he feels he's going to have to go and you're going to have to get him to try something like that, he won't come. You won't get him coming along at all. So we had... I mean, real eye-openers in this job. Uneducated, yes. Poor physical fabric, absolutely. Petty crime, drink and drugs, massive here. Mental and physical health issues. Enormous. This estate has become where even the council, because it's private, it's all private owned, and it's all in receivership, these blocks. So this is where the council, this is where you end up. You've got a guy here who um, was a sort of, what was a really brilliant story. He actually, uh, he tended a small plot of land behind the laundrette just next to here, on part of this estate, behind the laundrette. And the guy who runs the laundrette, who'd been held at knife point the week before because some guy had tried to steal the food, he said, bloody hell, not. and I made 21 quid in 50 pences in the day. He said, blimey, I'd have given it to him. But anyway, he was looking after this guy who came over to the consultation, and I realised after the consultation that he couldn't concentrate. This guy was completely distracted. He was a young lad, and he was wearing army fatigue trousers. He must have been about 28, 29 years old. He'd been chucked out of the army because he'd been working in Bosnia and Herzegovina. His job was, before anyone else got there, to dig up the bodies, separate them all out, put them into separate graves, and sanitise the ground before the rest and the news and everybody else got there. He did it for three full six-month periods in the army. At the end of the first one, he said, I don't want to do this anymore. He's a sapper, he's an engineer. I, I don't want to do this anymore. It's really affecting my... By the end of the second one, he was severely mentally ill. When they, deprived, when they actually took him from the army, he now will never recover his mental faculties. He lives here. Um, absolutely, an incredibly distressed man. Actually, his only salvation in life is growing plants. We're getting him involved in one of our gardening groups. It's a fantastic story, but it's a terrible story here. But we are talking about our role as landscape architects is about the survival of a community. Our brief, actually, was nothing to do with landscape. Our brief here is to increase the occupancy of the existing properties. So what's that to do with landscape? How does landscape deal with that? How do we do it? I've got to hurry. I've only got 10 minutes. Engagement. Everybody has talked about engagement, and I'm not going to preach to you about the difference between consultation and real engagement and really talking to people because you all know it. We as a practice have our own philosophy, which is here, but you will all know perfectly well that it has to be done individually and done with great care. Yes, we're talking about gardening, you're great. And we saw these hints. This is a real photograph on the site on the day that we went there. This man has an allotment. It's a long way away. He actually lives in one of these tenements, and I think those flowers are a lovely little hint to what's going on there. We do it through design. This is another one of our schemes we did in London. But, and our design is about people and it's about place. But when we went to Barrow, we thought long and hard creatively about how do you answer this problem here? Because we'd gone there and won this competition because we said, oh yeah, yeah, landscape's going to turn this around. They gave us the gig on the basis that we could turn this around. Can we really turn it around? And we told them this idea about a tipping point. Tipping point is simply an additional increment that in itself might not seem extraordinary, but that unexpectedly is just the amount of additional change that is needed. We thought, how do you change? And what is the necessary change here? And when we were thinking about that, we showed them this slide. We said, we had a simple point here. This is a courtyard in London. Similar sort of size, brickwork, same densities, same type of flat. This is Peabody in London. But here, when we did this scheme here, this, was a, this used to be just full of cars, exactly like the courtyard was exactly the same as the one we had there. And when we did this courtyard, and we changed it to this, 
things started to happen. People, quality of lives become instantly changed. They bought the fact that maybe a landscape could just do it. So back to our little tipping point. We actually needed to improve the entire area. But we know that the tipping point is, okay, how much can we really afford to do? We had a million quid here. Just, just that we've I've managed to badger them into a bit more now, but it's a million pounds. Centre of Barrows up there, we come to the first roundabout. It's all pretty grim. So I thought we have to do something here. We need to improve this bit of pavement because when anyone is coming here, they look, they want to see that. Then as they glance between these buildings, they need to see that. Then I want them to see this. Then I'm going to show them something fantastic. And hopefully by that point in time, because it links to the next key point, you will have delivered a first impression. Human brain takes seven seconds to make a first impression. Most business decisions are dealt with then. If you go and buy a house, which is what these guys want to do, most people have made the decision before they walk through the front door. 31 seconds, some psychologist has worked out, as the make, uh, as the, the, is the time that it actually takes for you to actually still have an open mind about something. After that, all you're doing is maybe if something quantum comes up, might change your mind. But you're going to be working against your initial absolute first impression. The so first impression is absolutely crucial to us. So we decided it must be attractive and welcoming. It must feel safe because it is cared for. It must overtly look like it's cared for and it must invite use. And that's about public realm. One of the things that hasn't been talked about a little bit is public private. All, when it comes to poverty and equality in planning, it is about the preservation and the recognition of the value of public realm. It is not in your own homes and in a private place where you become who you are, where your quality of life is determined, where you meet other people, where you're not lonely, where you play. That happens in the public realm, not in the private. That is a critical component of this. So when we talk about public realm in design in our office, it's all about social interaction. All of our design work and our practice is about how do I get that person to once again recognize that they know that person. And landscape is the key to achieving that. So each of these arrows is pointing at the staircases. So we just want this idea that when someone walks down one staircase, they might look up and go and talk to someone who's coming down another staircase over there. And they might actually walk along one of those lines where we will put incidences, things like bin chambers, things like things that you might have to do, where who knows, you might say, you're drinking an awful lot of Merlot each night because you're putting about four bottles in the bin chamber every morning. <laughs> you might start feeling a little bit of concern for your neighbour, but however that might work. But it's about social connection. And that's very key to a lot of our work. The other thing is green. Green in our cities is a critical ingredient. It's a critical ingredient. We can talk about that in terms of GI, we can talk about that in terms of biodiversity, we can talk about that in terms of water management, and we do regularly. What I want to talk to you about is it's about birdsong. It's about seasonal change. It's about tilling the earth. It's about a whole range of different things. But the green here was a real opportunity. You can see it's just a notion that you're right on the coast here. But this tenement block, we realised the only trees, there were no trees, I was, you know, 2019 actually, sorry. But actually a lot of them are in really poor order. But actually in here, you see one there, there it is. That tree is about the only tree that's vertical in Barrow, okay, because the sea it's pretty grim on the peninsula at Barrow. And it gave us this idea that we had a microclimate. And actually, within the tenements, you actually had an environment where you could grow things. A lot of people have tried to grow things in Barrow and it hadn't worked. So key to our idea is, is that we could create something that's amazingly verdant and green. So that when you actually have that first impression, they're gonna come in here and it's gonna be fantastically verdant and green. It's gonna be lovely. And then we can trigger all of those other landscape elements of growing and beauty and flowers and bringing people together that we can do. And we know it's possible because the architecture actually yields itself to that simple response. Here's our overall master plan. Crossing here, we're using bin stores. Bin stores are very important to us. Everyone says, no, you're really boring about bins. But for me, Bins are a place which aren't going to be going away anytime soon. You've got to do your recycling. It's an important part of life. And if you want to bring people together, if they're going to be chucking their rubbish in a bin, I want someone talking to them while they're doing it at 8.30 in the morning. And they will be doing that here. So this is our overall master plan. It's incredibly green uh, within the space. Green is also relatively good value. But it is absolutely fantastic value when it's about relieving poverty and bringing people together. Some of the tools that we use, my last slide, consultation we talked about, raising awareness of what we do, confidence through really understanding the issues. Landscape architecture 
it's kind of about landscape, but it's about life. It's a holistic game that we're playing that's so important. Recognising landscape includes everything. Trust me, the stuff I'm telling the leader of the council. Getting involved in everything, worrying about the fee or be, and being recompensed for what you're really doing. I went to the town council and I said, you paying me to do a landscape scheme here? I'm not doing a landscape scheme. I am absolutely profoundly bring, stitching this community back together. I am improving the quality of people's lives. I would like a lot more money, please. <laughs> And he said, that's fine. I doubled my fee in that meeting for doing no more work than I was going to do anyway. Which perhaps brings me on to getting political and leading. Leading. We must lead. Landscape architecture. I love Pam's passion and I know it because that's why we invited her when you spoke at our awards. The reality is landscape architects have to recognise that we are leaders and that therefore you courage in your convictions, getting political, having strong belief in what we do is absolutely central to our work. Thank you very much.